a butcher, a hitman for the Kinahans, close Ridwan Taghi ally, and key player in Europe's largest narcotic trafficking networks. How did a small-time Amsterdam criminal get to rub shoulders with the big guys? Meet Naufal F, better known as The Belly, an assassin who almost got himself assassinated. Due to his cyclical violence, he had made so many enemies that he wasn't even safe in prison while serving a sentence for his crimes. Antisocial, narcissistic, easily offended, impulsive, and with a weak conscience. This is how state psychiatrists described him, and that's the tip of the iceberg. His whole life is punctuated by his feverish attempts to avoid the law's grasp. Join me as I delve into the complex web of Nawfal's alliances and his relentless pursuit to evade justice, only to find himself ensnared in the unforgiving grip of the law. Nawfal, the enigmatic belly, the elusive Mr. Couscous, is a man of multiple personas, each entwined with a myriad of notorious exploits. Angry child, violent youth, was Nawfal destined for darkness? Does one's childhood define his later life? For Naufal Fassi, it certainly seemed that way. In the heart of Rotterdam, amidst its gritty streets and hidden shadows, Naufal Fassi was born in 1980, but grew up in and around Amsterdam. Raised amidst the vibrant chaos of Amsterdam's bustling canals, his turbulent childhood served as an early glimpse into the complex man he would become. Within the halls of Pantare, a school meant for difficult children, Nestled in the heart of Amstelveen, Naufal, known as Naufal, struggled beneath the weight of his inner demons. Even in his youth, his volatile temper often ignited uncontrollable bursts of rage, hinting at the tumultuous path of violence that lay ahead. As adolescence beckoned, Naufal succumbed to the allure of crime. He came in the police's radar in connection with a highly dangerous and violent robbery in Bijlmer, Amsterdam. In 2004, Caught in the web of his transgressions, the arms of the law ensnared him, leading to a stint in TBS, a measure aimed at rehabilitating the minds of the criminally disordered. Confined within the walls of a forensic psychiatric center, Knopfel grappled with his restless spirit, never truly subdued by his incarceration. Yet the call of the streets proved too potent to resist. Emerging from the shadows in 2012, Knopfel plunged back into the murky underworld of Amsterdam, his name now entwined with notorious figures like Gwyneth Martha and Khalid Jafar, embroiled in the infamous Mokro Mafia War. The war erupted over a stolen shipment of 200 kilos of coke, intended to pass through Antwerp en route to the UK and Ireland. The stolen stash vanished in Antwerp, plunging the underworld into chaos as both buyers and sellers remained clueless about its whereabouts. With each passing day, Knopfel's legend grew, his reputation as a formidable enforcer etched into the annals of Amsterdam's criminal underworld. He navigated the thin line between right and wrong, forging alliances with nefarious syndicates and climbing the perilous ladder of the narcotics trade. But it was his insatiable appetite for violence that truly set him apart. In the dim haze of the Jimmy Woo Club, he unleashed a storm of brutality, leaving chaos in his wake. As the echoes of his rampage reverberated through the city, Knopfel's notoriety soared, casting a long shadow over Amsterdam's cobblestone streets. By the twilight of 2012, Knopfel had become a figure of infamy, his name emblazoned across the pages of Dutch media. He was associated with a deadly attack causing double eliminations in De Stadsliedenburg, a somber testament to the reign of terror the underworld creates. In the turbulent chronicles of the Mokro Mafia War, the 2012 shooting incident marked another chapter in the ongoing saga of violence and retribution. Benaouf A, the intended target of the attack, narrowly evaded the attack but managed to identify Naufal Fassi, alias Nofal, as one of the assailants in front of the chief detective. Benaouf's chilling testimony described Nofal as a ruthless figure with a reputation for leaving no trace, a sentiment echoed by his ominous warning to law enforcement. Despite Ben Aouf's identification, the lack of sufficient evidence resulted in Nawfal walking free, underscoring the challenges of prosecuting individuals entrenched in the criminal underworld. Nawfal's involvement in the elimination of Samir Buyakrachan or Scarface in 2014 further illuminated his prominence within the criminal hierarchy. Dutch police suspected Nawfal's presence at the scene of the attack, believed to have been orchestrated by him, 
Yet once again, insufficient evidence prevented his prosecution. The global reach of Nafel's operations or elimination gigs was exemplified by the elimination of Scarface in a cafe in Benahabas, Spain, illustrating the intricate web of alliances and betrayals that define the underworld landscape. Nafel's criminal career was punctuated by multiple arrests and 12 convictions, a testament to his notoriety within the criminal underworld. His suspected involvement in the deadly meeting with Scarface and Najib Himik, another thug suspected of double-crossing Scarface, exemplified the calculated brutality that defined Nafel's reign in the criminal underworld. After the elimination, Najib went missing and was never heard of again. He is believed to be dead. Nafel and the infamous crime boss Rico the Chilean were the main suspects in his disappearance. Allegations swirled that Nafel acted on Rico's behalf, orchestrating the disappearance of Najib as part of their collaboration in eliminating their rivals. By this juncture, Nafel had ascended to the right-hand position of Ridwan Tagi, who had emerged as a dominant force in the illicit trade following Scarface's demise. Together, Nafel and Tagi implemented a strategic shift in their approach to the underworld economy. Previously content with receiving a share of others' narcotic sales, they opted to directly peddle their own contraband, significantly bolstering their financial clout. The transition to receiving payments in coke instead of cash elevated both Tagi and Nafel to unprecedented levels of power and influence within the criminal landscape. This shift not only solidified their status as formidable players, but also heightened the danger they posed to rival factions. How long could he elude the law's grasp? Can someone keep committing crimes and really believe they'll never face consequences? Nafel didn't realize that he was walking towards his fall slowly and gradually. The crimes he committed next would prove to be the cases that brought his downfall. In November 2015, Nafel plotted another elimination, targeting Piotr R., a cunning figure within the Dutch underworld. Intent on executing their plan with precision, Nafel's men donned stolen police uniforms, intending to intercept Piotr's vehicle. However, their meticulously crafted scheme faltered when Piotr passed before they could act. Undeterred by this setback, Nafel's determination remained unwavering. Two days later, his men tracked Piotr as he drove his mother to the hospital. Seizing the opportune moment, they launched a ruthless attack, riddling Piotr's vehicle with as many as 36 bullets, six of which hit Piotr. Despite sustaining injuries, he drove the car through the hedge and crashed into a ditch. He miraculously survived, thwarting Nafel's meticulously orchestrated plan. Nafel was furious at his team's failure. The PGP texts, seized by the law enforcement later, stated, Why didn't you burn the car in the garage? Can they find fingerprints or DNA in the car? I hope that f***ing dog dies. However, fingerprints should have been the least of the hoodlum's worries. The police were tracking the car, which led to the prompt location of the assailant's vehicle and the discovery of their encrypted phones. Nevertheless, coming back to the textual conversation, the reply from one of the assailants was, it could not be set afire immediately. We did not have another car to hop over to. We still needed it later. I am not trying to play you. We have discussed everything. We cleaned the entire car with ammonia. I just hope that dog is gone. The gunmen were Karim S, Adif M, and Kyo C. During the examination of the confiscated phones, law enforcement discovered a saved contact listed as Belly. However, Nafel's reckoning was still impending. It wasn't until several months and a series of peculiar incidents later that justice finally caught up with him for this attack. The motive behind his desire to eliminate Piotr remains unclear. However, considering Nofel's history of carrying out assassinations on behalf of others, it's plausible that this act was also ordered by a gang leader. These events offer an interesting insight into the complex dynamics of organized crime, particularly within the context of the Mokro Mafia War. Nafel's rise to prominence, alongside Ridhuan Tagi, underscores the fluid nature of power dynamics within criminal hierarchies. Their strategic shift towards directly peddling contraband represents a calculated move to consolidate their financial control and increase their influence within the underworld economy. The failed attempt on Pyotr R's life showcases the inherent risks and volatility of engaging in high-stakes criminal enterprises. Despite meticulous planning and execution, 
Unforeseen circumstances can derail even the most carefully laid out schemes. Knopfel's reaction to the botched operation highlights the ruthless nature that characterizes individuals operating at the apex of criminal organizations. His unwavering pursuit of vengeance underscores the unwritten rules of loyalty and obedience that govern such circles. Furthermore, the survival of Piotr R serves as a stark reminder of the precariousness of life within the criminal underworld. It also shows that in gangland, violence lurks around every corner and survival often hinges on split-second decisions. Overall, these events offer a glimpse into the intricacies of organized crime, where power, violence, and ambition intersect in a volatile and unforgiving landscape. But that's not the only hit Knopfel orchestrated that landed him in hot waters later. He orchestrated the execution of an Iranian individual, Ali Motamed, in Almere. Ali's real name was Mohammed Reksa Kolahi Samadi, who was living a quiet life with disguised identity in the Netherlands. He was given a death penalty by the Iranian government due to his involvement in Iran's deadliest bombing in 1981. But what would Nafal have to do with him? After thorough investigation, the Dutch authorities were sure that Ali wasn't involved in the underworld in any way. He was an electrician who minded his own business and led a quiet life. While authorities are not sure, they believe it was done at the behest of the Iranian government. And how did the government contact Nafal? That's an interesting question. A few journalists speculate that it could be Hezbollah. But whatever the reasons and whatever the modalities, one thing was certain that Nafal had taken on the execution as a freelancer. The Dutch Department of Justice affirms that Nafal was the intermediary in this entire episode. The intercepted PGP text to the hitman stated, Got a nice job for you. Why he has to sleep I don't know, and don't even want to know. 7 o'clock in the morning, he goes to work. This message was sent to Randall D. in November 2015, who was a renowned gangland figure in Amsterdam. However, Knopfel's plans hit a snag when Randall was arrested for an attack on another thug called Lucas Boom. However, in gangland, one resource that never seems to run dry is the abundance of hitmen willing to carry out contracts for a price. So Knopfel got two thugs, Anwar A and Morio M, to do the job. Just like that, on a cold December morning, Mohammed breathed his last. Mohammed Raza's elimination bewildered the Dutch media, as nobody knew who he really was. Finally, Dutch journalist Paul Vuchts broke the full story that took the world by storm. I did a lot of research on this assassination because there was something weird with it, and I was trying to find out who is this guy and when I published, his name was all over the world," said Paul Vuchts. The unsettling prospect of Nafal's potential collaboration with the Iranian government propelled the Mokro Mafia into a dark nexus with state-sponsored terrorism, shattering the boundaries of conventional criminality. This revelation struck a chord of concern within the heart of Member of Parliament Ulysses Elian, whose constituency bore the weight of Mohammed's tragic demise. For Elian, the issue transcended political boundaries, resonating on a deeply personal level as a poignant reminder of his family's own flight from the clutches of the Iranian regime. Elian said in a podcast by Brazen, We cannot accept a foreign nation, especially, you know, a tyranny like Iran arranging murders in our country. You know, a rule of law is being attacked by these people. And there is a link between the Moroccan mafia and the Iranian regime. One thing is for sure, if a Dutch criminal has these kind of connections, we all should be worried. This same member of parliament would later raise concerns about the lenient prison conditions afforded to Belly after his sentencing. For Knopfel's involvement in two elimination attempts, one of which proved successful, he made the calculated decision to maintain a low profile. Fishing boats, burgeoning trade, and escape to Berlin. What secrets lie behind these? Who would find Knopfel first, the police or the gang members? This question would be answered in a happening incident later in this video. But first, let me tell you about a cunning shenanigan Knopfel pulled to increase profits. He wasn't one to refuse an opportunity when he was presented with one. He delved into a clandestine yet lucrative enterprise in the quaint city of Urk. Renowned for its centuries-old tradition as a hub for Dutch fishing and its close-knit devout community, Urk also provided fertile ground for illicit activities. The bustling activity of fishing boats, constantly traversing in and out of the harbor, presented an enticing opportunity for illicit trade. 
Seized PGP messages uncovered a clandestine network engaged in the trafficking of coke, complete with images of coke bricks, negotiations regarding prices per kilo, and meticulously planned transportation routes. Knopfel spearheaded this sophisticated smuggling operation alongside two accomplices. The cunning strategy involved loading coke onto cargo ships traversing the Netherlands from South America, with the assistance of accomplices primarily hailing from Montenegro. These collaborators maintained communication with local fishermen, updating them on their location at sea. As night fell, cloaking the sea in darkness, the cargo crew discreetly tossed the illicit cargo overboard upon nearing the fishing vessels. But how did the fishermen locate the contraband in the pitch-black expanse of the ocean? This question was answered in a cryptic message. It's all in black duffel bags per 30 kilos. One empty 30-liter jerry can tied to each duffel bag and four lights attached to the bag, all tied together. Waterproof, etc. You know, but I'm telling you just in case. This continued for two years at least. It was a highly lucrative route, but the sun set on it when the police got the whiff of this cunning. A surveillance operation revealed the frequent gatherings of Johannes Inne, Mohamedas, and Leendert R. in a parking lot, arousing suspicion among authorities who anticipated imminent activity. Their vigilance paid off when Johannes N. was apprehended in 2017, caught red-handed with 216 kilos of coke aboard. Returning to Knopfel's whereabouts, as previously mentioned, he adopted a low profile following the execution attempts. By this time, he had become the most wanted criminal in Amsterdam, with both rivals and law enforcement in relentless pursuit. Fleeing to Berlin under an assumed identity, Knopfel remained mostly incognito. In 2015, a hit squad had been poised to strike after completing reconnaissance. Knopfel's daily routine, which included a visit to a Berlin cafe for coffee, presented the perfect opportunity. However, on the day of the planned ambush, Knopfel inexplicably failed to show up, evading capture once again. Fortuity seemed to be on his side. The persistence of criminal operations, as evidenced by the lucrative narcotics trafficking venture spanning over two years, illustrates the resilience and adaptability of organized crime networks. However, the swift intervention of law enforcement, triggered by vigilant surveillance and proactive monitoring, showcases the effectiveness of strategic policing in disrupting illicit activities. The apprehension of Johannes N. Thürer with a significant quantity of coke underscores the tangible impact of targeted law enforcement efforts in dismantling key players within criminal enterprises. Meanwhile, Knopfel's evasion of capture despite being the prime target of law enforcement signifies the challenges faced by authorities in apprehending elusive criminals entrenched in the underworld. His ability to navigate international borders and maintain a low profile exemplifies the intricate strategies employed by seasoned criminals to evade detection. The failed elimination attempt in Berlin highlights the unpredictable nature of law enforcement operations and the element of luck often at play in apprehending high-profile criminals. Despite concerted efforts by law enforcement agencies, the cat-and-mouse game between authorities and elusive criminals like Knopfel continues, underscoring the ongoing struggle to maintain law and order amidst the complexities of organized crime. Could the Kinahan save him? The boundaries of power challenged. With both his enemies and law enforcement hot on his trail, would his powerful friends be able to save him? If so, how long? Coming back to Knopfel, he fled to Dublin, where the Kinahans graciously extended their protection to him, providing him with a counterfeit passport and a safe house nestled in an affluent neighborhood. He was a close Kinahan ally, remember? And not only an ally, but a close friend who knew Daniel Kinahan for almost two decades. His attending Daniel's infamous wedding created ripples among the law enforcement for its guest list, which was a who's who of the underworld. He wasn't lying idle here either. Apparently, he was masterminding attacks on Kinahan's rival gang, the Hutch Gang. He also arranged bogus travel documents for Daniel and Christopher Kinahan, Irish Sun reported. Returning to Dublin brought him a sense of relief. According to Nicola Talent, a prominent Irish investigative journalist and Sunday World editor, he appeared quite at ease in Dublin, living openly without drawing any suspicion. Confident in the protection afforded by Ireland's most prominent organized crime syndicate, he found solace in his newfound sanctuary. However, he couldn't evade the watchful gaze of the media. Spotted at a Dublin zoo, 
he appeared as a mere tourist, portraying himself as a doting father. Remarkably, this photograph was captured barely a month after authorities uncovered his involvement in a plot to dispatch three hitmen, each paid 10,000 euros, to target Peter Rapp and Demon. However, Knopfel's streak of good fortune was short-lived as the long arm of the law finally caught up with him. In a meticulously orchestrated operation dubbed Operation Thistle, law enforcement agencies launched a crackdown on the notorious Kinahan cartel. The scene of the showdown was Knopfel's opulent luxury apartment, rented at a staggering 3,000 euros per month. Unbeknownst to the officers at the time, they had apprehended Amsterdam's most wanted man, a seasoned criminal with a string of convictions against him, operating under the alias Omar Gazouani on a falsified passport. Initially nonchalant about his predicament, Knopfel soon found himself engulfed in a whirlwind of escalating charges and mounting legal troubles. Before delving into the specifics of his legal battles, let's shed light on his dramatic arrest under Operation Thistle, spearheaded by Detective Inspector Paul Cleary and Detective Superintendent Peter O'Boyle from the Gardee's South Central Division. Interestingly, the officers had initially targeted Knopfel's hideout in anticipation of capturing Kinahan Associates. Detective Inspector Cleary recounted, as a result of the proactive nature of this operation and extensive surveillance and investigation, Gardee identified this apartment at Bagot Street as a base for the Kinahan Organized Crime Group. However, to their astonishment, the man they apprehended was linked to a staggering 17 deaths and a gruesome decapitation. Fassi attempted to deceive us by assuming another identity, but we swiftly identified him and recognized his significance to law enforcement agencies across Europe," Cleary added. Knopfel's ostentatious display of wealth, including an extravagant watch and 800 euro Valentino trainers, aroused suspicion. Further scrutiny revealed 12,825 euros in cash, underscoring his elevated status in criminal circles. Law enforcement officers also discovered two fake IDs, a Belgian and a Dutch one, each bearing a different name. Subsequently incarcerated, Knopfel's fingerprints were shared with Interpol revealing the depth of his criminal activities to Irish authorities. While serving a brief sentence in an Irish correctional facility for identity fraud, Knopfel vehemently contested extradition warrants issued by Dutch authorities, prolonging his legal battle and delaying his eventual return to face justice in the Netherlands. This saga offers a fleeting glimpse into the relentless efforts required by law enforcement to uphold law and order within the city. Operations like Operation Thistle stand as testaments to the tireless dedication and sacrifices of brave officers, whose unwavering commitment often involves relentless toil and at times even personal risk. Conversely, no matter how elusive or cunning a criminal may be, their actions invariably leave behind traces that, with diligent investigation and perseverance, can ultimately lead to their apprehension. Thus. This narrative serves as a poignant reminder of the intricate dance between law enforcement's diligence and a criminal's hubris in the perpetual pursuit of justice. Knopfel's indulgence in a lifestyle of ostentatious luxury amidst the clandestine underworld highlights the magnetic allure of wealth and power within criminal circles, blurring the lines between morality and temptation. Moreover, his protracted legal battles and the complexities of extradition proceedings underscore the arduous journey of navigating international legal frameworks in pursuit of accountability. It highlights the intricate dance between law and criminality in our interconnected world. Will the sun finally set on Knopfel's criminal career? Imprisoned and facing potential extradition to the Netherlands for more serious charges, what future holds for Knopfel Fassi now? During Knopfel's time in an Irish prison, an intriguing incident unfolded, shedding light on his close ties with the Kinahan clan. In December 2016, reports surfaced alleging that the Kinahan clan orchestrated an audacious attempt to free Fassi using explosives while he was being transported from prison to the local court. This account was initially reported by Het Parool, a reputable Dutch newspaper, citing sources from the Irish publication Sunday World. However, the credibility of this story is now in question, as the corresponding link on Sunday World's website is no longer accessible. Some speculate that rather than attempting a rescue, the Kinahans may have sought to eliminate Fassi due to his intimate knowledge of the cartel's operations. 
The purported attempt by the Kinahan clan to free Nawful Fosse from Irish prison with explosives is a chilling testament to the lengths to which organized crime syndicates will go to protect their own. This brazen act, if true, underscores the audacity and ruthlessness inherent in the operations of such criminal networks. However, the uncertain veracity of the story raises questions about the intricacies of criminal alliances and the potential for betrayal within these circles. Speculations suggesting that the Kinahans may have intended to eliminate Fassi due to his intimate knowledge of their operations highlight the inherent dangers of involvement in organized crime and the fragility of alliances forged within these clandestine worlds. Overall, this incident offers a sobering glimpse into the shadowy underbelly of criminal enterprises and the complex dynamics at play within them. However, according to the Irish police, Nawful was relaxed, as amiable and pleasant, not a care in the world. He received complete protection inside the Mountjoy prison due to his close ties with the Kinahans. The son cited a senior prison source saying, he's top dog in the jail and no one will go near him because of who he's connected to. Everyone is afraid of him. Other inmates have heard about his gang's violence in Holland, and they all know he has the connections and the money to arrange for people to disappear. However, it only lasted for a short time. He became agitated when the new warrant had arrived, this one for his involvement in the botched execution attempt at Piotr R. Subsequently, he was transferred to Port Louis Prison, Ireland's highest security facility, yet even this fortress was deemed insufficient for containing a figure of Fassi's caliber. Within its walls, he mingled with the notorious Dundon brothers, Desi John and Wayne, further amplifying the gravity of his presence. The Dutch authorities, sparing no expense, dispatched a military aircraft to Ireland to facilitate his extradition. As he bid farewell to Ireland, Amsterdam hastened to expedite the legal proceedings against him. Fashi was sentenced to 18 years for the attempted elimination of rival rap in 2015, followed by a life sentence for masterminding the killing of Iranian Dutch electrician Ali Motamed. The presiding judges, in delivering the verdict, maintained, Nafalef is a very dangerous man and an absolute danger to our society. Therefore, he is never allowed to participate in society ever again. Regarding his involvement in executions, investigative journalist Paul Vuchs depicts Fassi as a broker for assassination. He was in the middle. He had his soldiers and then he was their boss. It's very cold and clinical and it's just business they do. Knopfel's narrative serves as a stark illustration of the callousness and disregard for human life prevalent in gangland operations. Within this shadowy realm, morality holds no sway as individuals are ruthlessly eliminated for the pursuit of wealth and dominance. In this sinister calculus, human life is the cheapest commodity, yet the price exacted for its annihilation remains exorbitant. It exposes the stark realities of a world where the sanctity of life is overshadowed by the pursuit of power and the insatiable thirst for wealth. In this grim landscape, the value of human life is reduced to a mere bargaining chip in a high-stakes game of survival, where the cost of taking a life is measured not in remorse, but in the currency of blood and brutality.